Good afternoon, everyone. I want to call to order the uh, committee meeting of uh, the Student Achievement and District Instructional Performance um, Group. And um, we, we don't have to do a formal roll call, but we do have all of our members present, as well as administration liaison, Dr. Jonathan Brown, and Assistant Superintendent Shauna Murphy, and also a guest who will be presenting. And, and I see one of our DSLs here who, um, you're welcome to come to the table if you'd like. Um, we have a guest a presenter today, uh, Mr. Alula Asalo. I got it, okay, from the Ascend program. Okay, so uh, this is our first meeting and I, and I just wanna kinda share with everybody that um, the three board members are all new to student achievement. So we're gonna be looking for a lot of help uh, from our administration in terms of where we've been from last year so that we can get caught up and, and uh, move forward effectively and efficiently. And uh, today, I don't anticipate that we'll be here for a very long time. This is really kind of getting our structure together making sure we know what direction we're going in, ask, asking essential questions about the last year's work plan and this year's work plan. And then um, any other questions that come up as a result of that is fine. Also at the end, um, after it is not formally on your agenda, but after item number um, five, We'll ask for any other agenda items. I don't know if anything may have come up that people want to address, but we'll do that. And then we'll also hearing, have hearing of the public. We do have a few people who are in attendance. I can't see the number though, Rob. We have eight people in attendance. We will have an opportunity for hearing of the public um, toward the end of the meeting. So we appreciate it. And we have our uh, district District, I'm trying to think what DSL. Say that again. Director of School Leadership, and I knew that, it just slipped my mind. Uh, Dean Blaze here with us as well. Okay, so I um, do want to remind everyone that there is a, a slide you saw if you were in our audience watching this virtually. There was a slide that appeared which, gave, which gives you information on where you can access the minutes of the meeting. Um, we will show that slide to every public meeting that we have and people can always go back and refresh if, if they need to do so. Okay, so we'll jump right into our first item, um, board bylaws. So everyone received a packet and in, in your packet, it had the actual, actual bylaws um, of the Student Achievement Committee. And I don't anticipate a lot of discussion on that is needed, but I did wanna have the opportunity to ask the uh, committee members if they had any questions about it or thoughts um, about the bylaws. I don't have any questions. It looks pretty good. Okay. No questions? No questions. Wonderful. Okay. Great. And then, so if we, if we move on, we go to our, uh, before we move on, let me just say I'll also include it in your packet is a calendar of our meetings. Um, this meeting, as you know, was rescheduled from last week when we were closed. So um, we, that part is lost scheduled, but um, you have a calendar, except it doesn't have the actual date. So uh, I will make sure that we get that. Um, it will as assign dates to these. Now, in terms of the topics, you will note that uh, the right column has a lot of the topic areas. These are the topic areas that our administration has plugged in for us. Um, it goes from, from now to the end of the year. 
Um, there, there is another version of that that you might note. It's a more comprehensive schedule here. So it, it looks like this. And that is the uh, calendar of uh, topics that we should anticipate being on that agenda. I also want to add to that for board members, we can always add whatever we want. And usually the way I kind of like to work is you'll get a notice from Phyllis and, and Phyllis will ask you if you want to add something to the agenda. And uh, once that happens, I'll approve the final agenda. Um, I will ask uh, if people have any other concerns about the meeting prior to the, the notice being sent out. And I will also touch base with either Dr. Brown or Ms. Murphy around any additional administration items. And we, and, and we will have some discussion about um, anything looming that we might anticipate. So we want to stay ahead of that process and make sure that we're meeting our needs around that. So any question then about the calendar? Okay. The committee work plan for 2021 is also enclosed in your packet. Uh, we don't have a committee work plan 2022, but we will after today's discussion. So I thought we'd start by maybe asking Dr. Brown or um, Ms. Murphy if you could just kind of give us an update on where we stand with the 2021, if we've met our goals and priorities around that, are there things still um, out there looming or that we still need to work on? Um, and that'll give us some idea of how we, uh, what we want to add and how we want to approach that. Good afternoon, everybody. I would just want to share to start the conversation that a couple of areas in my department that a lot of times this can be hears from would be our athletics and activities. So if there is an interest there, we would love to be able to provide you with uh, updates. And then uh, this might cross over, it will cross over into policy, but I think it might be helpful for student achievement to hear about diversity, equity, and inclusion as well and i would also love to be able to provide you an update if we could get this scheduled of the work of our community learning centers oh good okay yes. great any other thoughts about that suggestions or ideas um go ahead dr brown Again, uh, what we've tried to submit in terms of the uh, work plan for the 22-23 school year was um, work around um, things that you might not hear about from the at the SAC committee, uh, such things as our, our college and career readiness um, pathways, uh, work that our director of school leaders uh, actually do as it pertains to high school graduation and high school graduation audits as well. Uh, there's a lot of work around college and credit plus uh, courses that we've uh, added. Um, and we just wanted to give you somewhat of a more robust uh, picture of some of the work that is ongoing in this upcoming year, uh, as opposed to um, what you have in front of you. So just for transparency, uh, I'm new. Uh, okay. uh, and so the agenda, this calendar was created prior to me. Okay. And, uh, and so many of the things that you're, you might be asking for an update for, uh, I can tell you about in terms of my participation here. Uh, but in terms of moving forward, this was a, an opportunity to, to share additional information that we thought that SAC may be interested in, in hearing about. Okay. Ms. Murphy, were you on the committee last year? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Well, it's good to have at least one of us. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of hard, I think, because we are all new and Dr. Mm -hmm. Brown included in that. Um, one of the things that I do know about uh, student achievement, um, and, and it was through my conversation with Ms. Bowers, former member Ms. Bowers, is that 
all of the topics for our agenda really align or correspond to something that is required of us by state or um, relate to major subject areas or, you know, not, not subject areas, but uh, areas of development or programming, curriculum and things like that. Um, the other, just to, to share with board members, I don't know if you read in your um, material, we also are responsible for the superintendent's evaluation. So that is something that um, we're going to have to have some conversation at full board level, um, given where we are. And uh, uh, I know last year we talked about developing um, or at least reevaluating the current tool for evaluation, evaluating the superintendent. So we probably need to, to add that to our list. Okay. Any other questions then about the um, calendar and the topic areas? So just for, just to be clear about how things flow, um, we have to we have to send notice of the meetings within um, 24, 48 hours, correct? So it would be great, and I will work on facilitating this to make sure that everybody has a chance to respond. Probably no later than four days before our actual meeting, it gives us a chance to to conversate around um, the areas because we we want the meeting to go as smoothly as possible. Um, I am a person that does not like long agendas. So we have to prioritize around that and we will do that. Um, sometimes we might have four, five, six items, but we're not gonna have 12 or 13. I can assure you that it's just too much. If we ever do, it will be an exception to the rule, but I doubt if we do. Okay, any other questions then? Questions or comments? Okay, so in the plan for the 2022, work plan because we have to turn in a work plan in March um, for our board members. Um, what I'm hearing is we can basically transpose what's already on here um, and make some adjustments as we need it. The plan itself is pretty, it's fairly uh, generic. It's generic enough where we can make the changes as we need to on the, um, the calendar, um, but I just want to make sure that if there are any subjects or areas that you all can think of between now and the time we submit, that it gets on the calendar somehow. Like the superintendent evaluation, I will add that. So if there's anything else, or if you have any other questions about what constitutes a topic, a legitimate topic for us, if we could, if you could let us, let me know, and we can have some conversation about that. Okay, go ahead. Um, so a topic that I, I'm not sure if I see on the work plan, I think it is on the work plan from last year, but going forward, is it possible to have some discussion or further discussion on our ELL and our ESL learners? ELL and e e ESL learners, okay. There is, it is um, in October, ELL, it, but this says ELL and IEP referrals. So you want to, you want to have like a broad scope. I would. And conversation. Okay. I would. As, Maybe as, a presentation or something. And like that. especially okay. as it results to um, the student achievement and how they are doing. Okay. So. Anything else? Uh, just from immediate kind of a glance, Ms. Murphy? I just wanted to share a thought that I had, um, which in my couple of years on SAG has not come up, but because this is about student achievement, um, the team may be interested in a presentation about teacher effectiveness or where we are with our hiring of uh, highly qualified um, teachers who are actually the people in front of our kids every day. Wonderful. Just as a follow-up, we did include that uh, in regards to our principal pipeline uh, as a suggestion in terms of how we hire principals as well as a suggestive topic uh, in the month of March. For March? 
Well, it's for the uh, suggestive work plan for the fiscal, for the 22-23 school year. Yes, gotcha. Okay. Great. I'm sure we're going to come up with other topic areas. Um, we will always put, uh, add that topic somewhere. I just need folks to think about kind of where it rises to the level of priority. So some of the more pressing topics, we want to get those done and up in the early months. Um, and then we can always work from there. Okay. Anything else then around the schedule, the work plan? So I think um, what we can expect around the work plan, I will go ahead and do a draft of the 2022 work plan. I will share it with everybody on this team. Um, we can do our edits as we need to and be prepared. I'm not quite sure when the next board meeting is, Ms. Davis. Oh, we won't be ready by then. <laughs> in March. Okay, at, in March. March 7th. We could probably have something done by March 7th. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, anything else then on the work plan before we move on? All righty, so we have a, a presentation around our high school graduation seals. And Ms. Blaze, are you gonna be our presenter on that one? Thank you. Uh, if not, I have additional copies. You got that already? Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting us to present on the Ohio graduation seal. Um, this is part of a complex and ever-changing um, graduation environment here in Ohio. And I'm very pleased to be here with some representatives from our Ohio, from our graduation seals committee. Um, and I will, they are available for question and answer and some may be, may be available to present slides. We'll see how this hybrid format works. Um, so thank you, new members of the board, welcome and thank you all for being here. Go ahead. So graduation, Ohio graduation law um, evolves over time and it is our job to make sure that students have all the resources that they need in order to uh, be successful in achieving graduation. Today we're here to focus on one of the three components of graduation. So just starting with an overview, starting with next year's cohort 2023, this year's juniors, students will complete their required courses and take required state tests. They will also need to demonstrate competency in both mathematics and English language arts. And this is brand new and very groundbreaking. They will be able to demonstrate readiness for post high school pathways by earning two diploma seals. So this design is intended to really meet the needs of the whole child to shift away a little bit from the regulatory um, constraints of the full testing regimen that's been in place for quite some time. Um, and I've provided you with resources at the end that go into much more detail than what we'll have time for here today. Okay, so with graduation seals, um, you can go ahead. Uh, a quick overview um, in terms of how this has played out at Cincinnati Public Schools is that a few years ago, there was an original SEALs draft. All the um, this news of SEALs came out and there was an amazing effort that was uh, guided, I believe, also by Assistant Superintendent, Ms. Murphy. And um, we needed to be able to provide clarity on uh, our state-defined SEALs as well as provide direction on what are called locally-defined SEALs. We'll go into more detail on that in a little bit. But the My Tomorrow Committee was formed and created a set of locally defined seals, which include, according to state law, a community service seal, 
a student engagement seal, and a fine art seal. The student engagement seal um, has been updated and those updates are provided to you in your memo. Um, we, the team this year did an amazing job in the fall and they called around to different districts to find out what people were doing and they identified tracking documents and things of that nature that would allow our students who are involved in athletics, clubs, musical performances at the schoolhouse to get credit for that basically in the form of a student engagement seal. The second update that we did was around our community service seal. And that also we took a look at, we refined the number of hours, um, we made sure that it was um, in keeping with what other districts were doing as well as staying on the cutting edge. So at this point, students may earn a student service seal by completing 60 hours of community service over the course of their four year career in high school. We also designed um, tracking documents, working with our community partners who already do lots and lots of community service with our students and are working to streamline that. We did further revisions to our fine arts seal. So there are many, many, many ways that students can earn a fine arts seal. And this is one I'm very excited about. Dr. Rudnick has been just an extraordinary leader in helping in working with our teaching staff and our counselors to understand how kids who are talented in the fine arts can be recognized for that hard work. So those are the three locally defined seals that students who have talents in um, fine arts, who are compelled to serve through community service or who are busy, busy, busy with their athletics and clubs activities, they can get recognition for that now. And in fact, it's part of the graduation requirements. There's a fourth sort of special circumstance um, that I wanna also share with you. This, uh, and we'll go into more detail with that when we get to our visual slide, but the technology seal is a little bit of a hybrid. The technology seal is state defined, but we do have some local control over that as well. Um, finally, I do want to draw attention to the um, communications that we've had so far. Graduation seals were communicated to principals and to counselors during our December My Tomorrow retreat. Um, each school was provided with a set, a, what we call a toolkit. This is sort of a handy dandy with these physical seals. You all have a copy waiting for you in the board office. Um, but this allows you, when anybody has questions about student engagement seal, to say, oh, as a matter of fact, here are the provisions. Um, your PowerPoint may have a copy of all of those also embedded in there. We can make that available to you if you need it. Um, and we're preparing a communications launch for our cohort 2023 students and their fa and families and uh, you know other people who would be involved with the SEALs. Slides. So to dig in a little bit further, um, these are our nine state-defined graduation SEALs. We have the SEAL of Phi Literacy for students who are Phi Literate. We have a Citizenship SEAL, which students can earn through uh, basically testing either through their end of course exams or through AP courses or CCP. We have our Science SEAL with similar provisions. Those are, um, they can earn their Science SEAL through AP, through uh, College Career Plus, or through getting uh, an adequate score on their uh, end of year exams. We have an honors diploma and college ready seals. These um, dig into what would set a student above and beyond in the honors fields and be in demonstrating college readiness. Um, a lot of that has to do with ACT scores, SAT scores, and things of that nature. And then we have an industry recognized credential. This is really streamlined to allow our students in career technical education to earn a seal for their participation in that uh, world. I group those together with a blue field behind them because all of those credentials really require a pretty high level of testing accountability. So um, that's just something to know that for some of our students who may not be amazing test takers, we did wanna point out in the second tier that we do have some non-test option seals available. So one of those is military enlistment. There is, of course, a test to make sure that kids can get into the military, but it's um, not sort of the same level as the others. We also have our Ohio Means Jobs Readiness Seal, which is a 
something that's already available through our alternate graduation pathways. And then we have our technology seal. And I said we'd come back to this one. This is where I wanted to pause for just a moment. This is a really cool opportunity for students who are interested in technology to take advantage of courses that we offer here at Cincinnati Public Schools and to earn a technology seal. Um, they need to take either two semester or one full year course of technology and they need to be creators. They can't just be users of technology. So they have an, individ an individual project to complete. Um, this is what we, when we think about you, uh, creators versus users, this can't just be a tech class where kids are doing gaming or where they're using technology. They actually create and code and do all those awesome things that um, are really creative and lots of kids get into. So the reason I highlighted that here is it really of the nine, it is one of the only seals that is state defined that students can earn through coursework alone. And all students have to earn two seals, one of which must be state defined. So my hope and prediction is that we may actually have more and more students seeking courses in technology. That's down the road, just something to flag for you. Any questions up to this point? Any questions for members up to this point? Okay. Now, here's where technology really comes in handy. So um, we do have some folks on board that are ready to present briefly on these three seals, but I don't know if we can dial them in. Are they able to come in? I know we've got a Jennifer Lutz who is able to present briefly on our community service seal. We have a Renita Brooks, I believe, who is available to present on student engagement. And I believe we may have Dr. Rudnick available on fine arts. For the presenters we just mentioned, you'll have to accept the interactive invite and then you can unmute your camera and um, microphone for us. Like we've got two or three at least. Uh, Dr. Blaze, is that Ms. Brooks? Hello, Ms. Brooks. So um, she is prepared to go ahead and speak. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about the student engagement seal. Um, the student engagement seal is um, I'm just what it sounds like. It's a way. Oops. We lost her. So I can't, she did share with me what she wanted to speak with. She said, I'm in my car, I'd love to participate, but she wanted to say hello and also to discuss the current requirements. One is that students can actually earn a, a student engagement seal through a PE, the same, um, requirements that we currently have in place for a PE waiver, a physical education waiver by participating in athletics. That's super easy for us to track. It's already in power school and that's something our counselors are ready to support. She also wanted to, um, we're looking at students who are engaged in after school musical theater programs or theater programs that that is a very significant time allotment and that they would also be able to um, track that fairly e easily through attendance logs and things of that nature. So we do also have, of course, a very robust Schedule E program, which has along with it, uh, everybody who is in charge of a club keeps records of student attendance and student um, you know, engagement. And so that's another way that we're working on being able to track our students' engagement in these clubs and activities. So I think I, I covered it all for Ms. Brooks. 
Um, and I'll hand it over to Ms. Luce to discuss our community service. So Jenny, if you could introduce yourself and where you are. Yeah, hi, I am Jenny Lutz. I'm one of the school counselors and I Montessori High School. Um, I am here to talk today about the community service seal uh, for students. Um, our community at Clark, we've had a, a long tradition of students participating in community service as being one of the foundation elements to our Montessori program. Um, but we know that many students across the district are participating in community service as well. Uh, the way that the student would earn the seal is by completing 60 hours of community service over the course of four years while they're in high school. So it's just 15 hours a year. Um, and then there is some guidance there around being involved in the planning and execution and um, reflections on the projects that they are participating in. Um, in addition to that, we have an, an awesome new program this year. We're still sort of working out all the kinks on that, but the X2 Vol is a application that students can register and um, record their hours and their participation with different organizations so that it's a one place uh, where students can hold and record all of those records of community service hours and participation. Um, each school does have a person or maybe multiple people if advisors are in charge of tracking or sort of working with students on tracking this type of community service involvement. I know many schools, if they have a National Honor Society Club, um, that person is usually tracking community services. That's also a required component for students earning National Honor Society recognition as well. Um, so it's an, it's an awesome opportunity for students to sort of double dip in addition to building their resume and uh, putting those very important community service hours onto their college applications as well. Thank you, Jenny. And Thank you. We have Dr. Rudnick. Everybody hear me? Yes. Can everybody hear me? No. How about now? Can everybody yes. hear me now? Okay, great. Yes. Uh, so I am Dr. Izzy Rudnick. I'm the Curriculum Fine Arts Manager. Uh, we've been working really diligently to come up with massive amounts of ways for students to earn a fine arts deal. Basically, there's two pathways. One pathway is to excel in a non-introductory arts course uh, in their high school. Um, they must get an A or a B in two non-introductory arts courses, and they must fill out an artistic reflection and submit that. Um, the second way, and this is a way I was especially passionate about, is allowing our students to um, get credit for after-school arts that they were doing with a community organization or at their own school if they were involved in a major theatrical production, both behind the stage and also in front of it, okay? Um, also wanna point out this is for all the arts, okay? So this is for dance, drama, music, visual art, photography, everything. And this project idea allows them to do a unique project to put together a small art show of their own work, to do a music recital, uh, to compose a few compositions. And it enables our students to show their unique creativity. So we really have something in this seal uh, for all of our students that are artistic and go above just the basic requirement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rankin. If we could return to the PowerPoint. So this uh, is a very exciting turn for Ohio. It is unusual for an Ohio, for a statewide SEAL program to be in place like this. Um, and so we're excited. Uh, there is one provision that was announced in October that actually even students this year 
if they needed to, could be using 2023 cohort graduation requirements. So we've got a little bit of a pilot opportunity. We don't know how many students yet are gonna take advantage of the 23 cohort regulations, but it is a possibility even for this year's senior. So right now we're at the point where we're like, looking at vendors, who's gonna print these seals? Where are we gonna get them? They actually go on to the diplomas. So it becomes a part of the student's prideful record that goes on their parents' walls and all that fun stuff. Um, we, the power school team, uh, led by Joyce Bird and Eric King and um, Barb Auden has been just incredible behind the scenes. At this point, it's looking very promising that every single student's power school record is going to also include their seals. And so even as freshmen, if a student loves doing community service and they hit their 60 hours, they can get recognition of that seal. So when they graduate, they know that they're on their way. The counselors are really the crew that's being charged with, along with all these other graduation requirements, making sure that kids get their seals. So you are able to hear from um, a couple of our counselors, Jenny Lutz from Clark and Mr. Nita Brooks, and um, we're looking forward to getting their continued participation. Next slide. So this uh, is just our team that has brought this all together and we're so grateful to all of them. Not everybody could be here today, um, but this is our existing team and they will be able to move forward with communications with the students and the families so that they know well in advance what to expect for their graduation requirements next year. That's it, open to questions. Okay, thank you. Open for questions, board members. Um, I just wanna say, I think, this is a great opportunity to give measurable goals for students. And I think that's a really big part of showing success. Uh, so I, I think it's it's pretty awesome. Um, I just maybe have the one question of, as students are going through and working towards per achieving those goals for the SEALs, what kind of discussion about their progress is had with them during that time? I'm sorry, could you repeat that last part? Like, how do you, how, or what discussion it would be had with students as they're going through the process, making progress towards those goals throughout the process, or through, you know, throughout the time they're trying to achieve those seals, yeah, um, especially so that, if there's opportunities for them to do something else to. So if I think I understand the question is, what is our process then to notify students about these opportunities as they move through? Yes. Okay. So um, that will be through counselor visits to schools, through advisory with the regular graduation requirements and also support mostly through the counselor suite and their teachers. Um, We're also looking at um, flowing this through athletics and Josh Harden is aware of this so that, for example, that um, PE waiver is a very powerful way for students to be able to track. They're very motivated by the PE waiver they love athletics, and then now they know they can also get a seal for that. Thank you. Mary, you have comments, questions? I don't. I think it sounds really good, and I'm excited to learn a little bit more, especially as I have a child that will eventually be getting into the grade right here shortly. There you go. They can get more than two seals, by the way. So we anticipate there's going to be some kid out there who's like, I want all. I want all. <laughs> I, I have a few questions and, and uh, you have to forgive me because some of them sound a little like, I mean, I really don't know anything about the SEAL. So if they, there's no dumb questions, so I won't say that, but um, uh, just so I'm clear in my head, these, the, these SEALs are mandated by law. Is that correct? They are in the newest set of graduation requirements. Graduation yes. requirements. Yes. Okay. So every student is required to gain two, at yes. least two, but they have the option of gaining more. Correct. And, and then um, I think um, one of the speakers answered the next question that they use it to really build their resumes Absolutely. and put it on college applications. So that's the return for them on that, right? Yes. Okay, good. Um, is so you, I heard you say also that they will, these will also be added to their diploma. Mm -hmm. So is it given to them like this? I think they'll have to be smaller unless we want to Yeah, get that's what I like was wondering. Check. That's my question. No, no, they'll be smaller. Okay. <laughs> this is and, for us to read. And are, are you all anticipating that all of our students 
will yep. be will gain they they have to have at least two yep. this year starting next year next year thank you i just wanted to be clear about that yeah this year can if okay. they need an alternate pathway okay gotcha okay um and just for clarity um, there are the ones that are mandated by state, but then we also have our locally uh, designed ones. Uh, yes. So I if you look, the ones clear. that are locally defined have the CPS symbol on the bottom gotcha. left corner. Okay. Yep. Those are my questions. I, I thank you for answering those. Go ahead, Mary. I'm so happy that you asked the question about how big they were because I was looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, it's going on the diploma. Where is this going to go? But yes, thank you. <laughs> they're they're grab the diplomas and they'll fall all out on the stage. So, you know, okay. Well, great. I, I think this is a great start to student achievement because I learned something that okay. I didn't know. So You're good job. Yeah. Point. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Blaze? Thank you, Dr. Blaze. Great presentation. You and okay. So moving on, um, I asked uh, Ms. Murphy if she could give us an update on uh, school board school pitch night. Actually, in terms of a committee uh, topic or something, I asked her to do it because it was an event that happened a couple weeks ago that we participated in. There are some definite implications for how we move forward. I don't know necessarily, well, I guess it would happen in student achievement to some degree, but I wanted her to really share with with rest of the board members and the community what happened. Thank you. I'm very excited about this event. Um, in addition to Vice President Jones, Board Member Morosky, Superintendent Amat, and I were invited by School Board School in conjunction with Cohere to listen to pitches from School Board School's current class. And within the class, they selected uh, several pitches to share with us. But then today, you may not have seen yet, they, they went ahead and shared the rest of the pitches. So I'm very <laughs> um, interested to uh, read and learn a little bit more. So these were uh, very interesting because most of the school board school members are adults who did the pitches. But at the same time, there were a couple of students who led pitches and uh, they were delightful. So you'll see at the center of this um, one pager that I shared what the pitches were. And the idea was the four of us were to select one that we thought would be our favorite. And their request was that either those policies or those practices would then be implemented within Cincinnati Public Schools. So the four of us were to select one. Well, we selected two. And then the audience were asked also to select one. They selected two. Two. And so the asterisks uh, on the list are the ones that were actually selected. Uh, so teacher diversity, creating an equity plan or using this DARE tool, uh, building a more equitable and inclusive school finder and dress code. Uh, the dress code piece was from a student at SCPA and uh, wanted us to take a look at the diversity equity issues around student dress code uniform or no uniform, uh, where there may be some inequities with male, female, uh, body type. It was very, uh, very interesting. Uh, so that was one that was selected. Building a more equitable uh, and inclusive school finder. So let's say I'm new to Cincinnati and I'm new to Cincinnati in July and I need to select a school for my child. I am not familiar with our magnet programs, I'm not familiar with our neighborhood programs, I'm not familiar with our structure, this school finder would say to me and to my child, well, what types of things are you interested in? Are you interested in learning a foreign language? Or are you interested in our Montessori program? Let me share a little bit more about Montessori programs. And so we thought that this would be a way that would be helpful to families, especially new to our area and not as familiar with our school system, or even uh, our sixth graders trying to decide what high school, seven to 12, they would attend. Um, uh, let's see, the DARE tool is a way for departments or schools within our district to uh, self-assess where they stand with diversity, equity, inclusion in terms of their practices and procedures within their school buildings or, or the departments. And then the teacher diversity one was looking at pipeline uh, for Cincinnati Public Schools. 
and the need for there to be more people of color uh, in front of our, our students. So I shared with Ms. Bunty, who's in charge of talent, the teacher diversity presentation. And I also shared with her dress code because she's uh, responsible for our positive behavior inclusion pieces as well as positive school culture. And dress code is a part of our uh, behavior policies. And then my team is looking at the D.A.R.E. tool and then uh, the school finder. So we are just, this, this night was January 26, just a few tender weeks ago. And so we're just getting started digging into these pieces. Um, it was a good night. Uh, I was very proud of the thought that they put into the presentation. I think they are available if uh, other committee members are interested in seeing them. Um, I, I just wanted to add to that, that um, it's cool for those members of the public who don't know what School Board School is, it was School Board School is a program, I believe it has um, some national recognition, and Mary, you are a part of that, but um, it, okay. So it, it is a national program, but we have one here locally based that was started by a former board member, Elisa Hoffman. And the program here has really grown tremendously and is very successful. Um, and I know there are people at the state that have called me about it and said, what's the school board school and put us in contact. Um, I think uh, just putting this out there for us to consider and some of the the pitches lie in the policy arena. And so it's important for us to kind of check to see where they are with it. But as we think more and more about uh, community engagement and, and uh, uh, strategies for how we um, respond to community, this might be a way of doing something ongoing. We could partner around this pitch night scenario because I got the feeling that everybody who was involved with this um, was eager about working with CPS around these things. And uh, it, it doesn't cost us anything to do it. We just have to look internally, see what our resources are to it, and just do it. And uh, as Ms. Murphy said, um, we had young one young man, I won't identify him by name, but he's at uh, School of Creative and Performing Arts, who did an excellent presentation around the dress code. And I'm sitting there going, how could we say no to him wanting to impact policy like that? You know, so we, it was, uh, it was intended that we would get at no more than two pitches. And we ended up getting four. So that's what we have to work on. We have to make sure that we can manage those. But I appreciate the update and um, maybe what we can do is anticipate um, another update at some point, whenever it's comfortable for you, Ms. Murphy. So you can let us know. Mary? And just to add, um, I, I didn't get an opportunity to watch the actual live session um, being a part of School Board School. I did watch the recording. I was absolutely blown away. Yes. We have so much talent. We have so much talent in Cincinnati, in our community, and even our students. And so I definitely would um, piggyback off of what you said. Definitely partnering with School Board School, continuing this, and really, you know, getting that engagement of the community and getting them involved. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? I, just, I was going to add on to just, I think, while a lot of these things are policy related, they do directly in impact a, many of our students' abilities to learn in the classroom. And so I think one specific one that was raised to my attention a while ago was the dress code issue, which that there were several students who were removed at times throughout their schooling and or and or made to feel singled out or embarrassed in class and these type of things. And so paying attention to these types of things as we go along and as we're building opportunities within our schools and hearing from the students that are telling us that this is an issue that's important to them, mm -hmm actually also helps them feel better in the class itself, which mm -hmm. is a great part of what the goal of this committee is, is to, is to focus around ideas that improve quality of education that the students are receiving and the ability for them to achieve their mm -hmm. highest heights. And so I think it's great that we have these wonderful, uh, wonderful pitches that we now must <laughs> find a way to manage. <laughs> yes. 
but but I'm really happy to hear about it. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Have you any comments? Thank you for that update. That's exciting. Yeah. Okay. So next on our agenda, um, I want to introduce um, Mr. Um, Asalo. As Asfal. As I'm sorry, Asalo. <laughs> who is the director of the Ascend program, which is uh, operates out of Bond Hill That's School, right. That's right. who's gonna do a, a short presentation for us. Thank you, board member Jones. I appreciate the opportunity to be here to tell you guys a little bit about what we do. Um, thank you, Rob, for the slides. Uh, I'll start, so yeah, my name is Alula Asfa, I'm the executive director of the Ascend program. Um, I wanted to start by telling you about what student population we serve. I'll try not to speak off the, camp, the mic here. Um, the student population that we are focused on serving is what we might describe as uh, the bottom 20% of achievers uh, in grades three through six at Bond Hill Elementary. This is the population of students that has the significant academic gaps, social emotional needs, in and out of school behavioral challenges. Um, and our goal is to work to support our classroom teachers and our administrators at those schools by um, supporting that very particular narrowly defined subset of students. So we can call these subset of students our highest need or highest potential set of students. Next slide, please. So I wanted to just give you the really practical elements of how it is that we operate day to day. Um, Ascend works with these low performing students and three to through six, um, we work, we pair um, our students up uh, with uh, somewhere between nine to 10 or 11 um, students. We call them learning coaches. Learning coaches work with students, um, participate students on one on one, twice a week, and 45 minute sessions, so for a total of 90 minutes. They work on low floor, high ceiling math tasks that foster growth mindset and support social emotional development. Each of these sessions takes place during the school day in one of Ascent's learning stations. These are immersive student-centered learning environments that we have outfitted within the school building. Uh, you can see the picture there in the corner. Next slide, please. I want to talk to you a little bit about the curriculum that we use to support this subset of students. And I think it's a part of what makes us unique, and it's a part of why I think we've seen some really great results in addition to our amazing teacher partners. So this is an example of a task, it's called Scoop It Up, where we ask students to take, say, three scoops of ice cream, that say it's vanilla, chocolate, and mint, and try to think about different ways that they could order it. Now the magic behind this curriculum task here is that it has different entry points. This is why we call it low floor, high ceiling, right? It allows us to work with a subset of kids in a broad range of skill levels. So you can see how a task like this allows you to go all the way up to working on factorials. Another part of what makes this magical is that what we implement in here is students, uh, what we call habits of mind, right? Where we start to teach things like and foster things like systematic thinking, right, perseverance, and we believe that the best way to teach social emotional skills is to embed them within the curriculum. And this subset of student population that we work with, we believe working one-on-one -on -one in these environments that we've created within the school in partnership with our school partners fosters just that. Next slide, please. So this is just a picture of what it looks like when students and learning coaches are working together. You see at the top uh, that happening in person. You see at the bottom a screenshot of students doing this virtually given the COVID time period that we've had. Next slide. So the theory behind our approach, right, is to introduce learning coaches, this new subset of support uh, folks within the school building that work with our teacher partners and they take effectively they take really focused responsibility for this subset of students who are our highest need subset of kids right and the idea is to increase student engagement in the classroom reduce disciplinary infractions and accelerate their academic learning and outcomes 
and also at the same time allowing our teacher partners to be able to focus their efforts on teaching grade level content within the classroom. And our belief is that this kind of partnership with administration and teachers is what leads to transformative outcomes, not just for the kids that we serve, but for the whole school as a whole. Next slide, please. So I want to talk to you a little bit about data and outcomes. So I want to say first as a qualifier that the way that we think about data is we take students that are performing in the bottom two tiers of air exams on the state air exam. And in our third grade population, which we're highlighting here, we took students scoring only in limited. The population of third graders scoring in limited only was large enough that we took half of that subset of students and we had them work with us. And naturally, the other subset served as a control. So what you're seeing here on the left, or my left, uh, is the raw numbers of on map scores. On the right, what you're seeing is the percent of growth as compared to the control group. Now, 75% of Ascent students grew by an average, by, had an average of five point growth, while only 17% of our control group um, had that kind of growth. Now, let me repeat that. This also took place during the COVID year, right? 75% of our students had an average of five point growth. And it's also, I want to also point out that 42% of that subset of students that we worked with had uh, 10 points or greater growth. Um, next slide, please. So this is just breaking it down a little bit further by students with IEPs. I wanted to just provide you that. Um, obviously, data is not doesn't tell all the story here. Um, and I wanted to make sure that we incorporated a video to tell you a little bit about, uh, hear from our, teach, our teacher and principal partners. So if we could, we could cue the video, that'd be really great. And then I'll talk a little bit about that. So we know that all of our students regardless of them coming in at the same grade level, they're not on the same grade level necessarily in their academic progression. But what we wanna do from year to year is narrow the gap. And so one thing that ASCEN has been able to do is focus on closing the gap while the teachers are also focusing on keeping the grade level content being taught at the same time. It's hard to uh, separate you from being staff because you are such a special kind of partner because you get in there with the staff and you work with them on a larger capacity of what's needed for our students. I would say looking at the big picture, it's needed because someone finally comes in the building and says, let's look at um, the lowest 20 percentile of the students and let's figure out how we close their gaps to make them move up to the next level. We've been at Bond Hill for five years now. We've seen some really significant growth in the student population that we've worked with. And I really wanna give my, like a really heartfelt and strong shout out to the principal, to our teacher partners, who have really been the most amazing folks uh, to work with these last five years for us and to see these results. Um, our work has been especially important, we think, during this COVID time where our highest need student populations have really needed this kind of support. And COVID has had a significant financial impact on us. And a part of the reason why we wanted to have this conversation and start this conversation by telling you about who we are is um, we have had financial strain and wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to tell you about what it is that we do and so that we can have separate conversations with administration, et cetera, around um, how we might be able to bridge the kind of funding gap that we have for this rest of these four months uh, to finish off the school year. But we're really grateful for the opportunity to tell you about what it is that we do. Um, I wanna invite all of you to come and check us out in person. Um, we have had Mike Morosky, board member Morosky has visited in the past, um, but I'm really grateful to be here and to tell you about it. Board, board member Carolyn Jones, thank you so much.
and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions? Mary? Yes, I have a, uh, two questions. So how how many of our CPS schools have, how many, um, I guess, schools have this program? Is it just the Bond Hill right now? It's just the Bond Hill right now, yes. Okay, and it's been around for five years? It's been around for five years, yes. Okay. Well, our, our goal has been to establish our effectiveness more meaningfully and fully. Okay. And have, you know, I think our hope is that next year we can have conversations about what it looks like to, to expand. And the administration has been really helpful in uh, writing support letters to think about what growth and expansion can look like. And we're grateful for that. Okay. I definitely um, will take you up on the offer of coming to visit and really checking out the classroom and seeing how it works as well. So thank you. Do you have questions, Ben? Uh, I don't have any questions. I do want to say I think it's tremendous uh, that you all are working to level up with each uh, as each student's experience grows, right? And so within the program, the point of it being to build upon what they're learning and build upon them. So I think that's always really important that we keep in mind uh, for our students. So I think it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, my question, Mary asked my, the same question that I had, so I won't repeat that. Um, just so uh, just to kind of add to this conversation, I'm, I'm so happy that you were able to come and you and I kind of touch base almost at the last minute. So I was happy that you were able to be flexible enough to be here. Thank you. Um, it, I, I think the, the intent here is, uh, in my opinion, at this point in time, is to recognize that um, it is important for the board to, for board members to really know uh, a little bit about part the partners who are serving our kids and what have you. What, what I think, as I spoke with our guests about in our phone call, was that some of the process and procedure for any potential next steps or anything has to be vetted out a little more. So, and he understands that, and I appreciate that, that from the board's perspective, it is important that folks present to us, let us know so the public knows what, what, we're, what we have to offer, but that um, because there is no clear process beyond that, in terms of what next steps or what what they might be hoping um, for the future of their program, that we would not have that conversation here right. as yet. So um, I think the next step then is that um, I, I can, I'm certainly happy to give you a call, yeah. maybe to talk about your interests and any potential next steps yeah. and, and offer some guidance and some direction around how that might happen. Yeah, I appreciate that, okay. Board Member Jones. I think for us, it's, uh, I think what brought us to this table is, you know, a, less a desire to t have an immediate conversation about what growth and expansion looks like and more the immediate kind of emergency need that we have for, four, we have four months of pay period gap that we have. And that's a part of how we came to the table is we weren't sure exactly how to engage and we were offered this opportunity to tell you about who we are. And this really came to be, frankly, because we are in a little bit of an emergency financial situation of needing uh, to, to be able to finish off the school year. So our hope is that we can have um, as immediate as might be possible conversations around ways in which the school district might be able to help support us to finish off this academic year. Okay. Yes. Uh, just. A, one question, actually, building off a little bit of what Carolyn was talking about with regards to timing. So I think it would be helpful also to hear a little bit more about the role of the learning coaches in the program and the benefit of the student being a or benefit of the student being a learning coach, uh, because I do think there's an aspect of that that kind of goes in line with what we've been talking about earlier with these goals and stuff that they're achieving throughout is that a student who's a learning coach actually is also learning at the same time that they're giving up help and giving assistance. So just to make sure I'm clear, the learning coaches are um, uh, not teachers, but there are folks who are some number of years out of college, may have an interest in teaching, may have been teachers in the past, who serve as learning coaches, and they work with a cohort of uh, students that somewhere between the numbers, somewhere between nine and 12 kids or so, and they are paired with that set of kids 
over multiple years. And that's the power and transformation that we see is they have the same subset of kids three, at least for two years, often for three years. So the commitment that we ask of learning coaches that we bring in, we have a set of four that are working at Bond Hill. Um, and we are seeing really amazing results because in part because of this continuity of there's these relationships that are being formed and developed that start in third grade and that uh, blossom, right? And, but what you're saying still stands. I think there is more to, to unpack. I was listening to the presenter earlier talking about badges, and I was thinking about the ways in which some of the work that we're doing could be really integrated with that as well. well and, I, and again, I appreciate the clarification there, because I do think it's actually, even, even with having someone committed, the playing that role as a learning coach is a really great thing, and I think that's another opportunity for folks within a community who would want to be able to assist or help yeah. to consider those options. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you again. Thank you very much. And, I appreciate it. You're welcome this. to stay, even though I don't know if we have any more uh, discussion about the program, but uh, it's up to you. Sure. Okay. Um, so uh, moving on, any other agenda items that we didn't specifically identify on the agenda, board members? No? Okay. Uh, I just uh, I have one, it's more of a question for um, Dr. Brown and Ms. Murphy, is just um, when opportunities are being presented, such as stuff like the Ascend program or things like that, is it best to bring those directly? Um, or I guess I would I would want to hear about those things a lot of times as, as there's, they're Can going I, on in the school. Yeah. yeah, I don't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. But I, I do want to respond to that. Yeah, I, mean, I was just thinking that as we are hearing about them, as other folks are hearing about them in the community and those type of things, it's, it's a great opportunity for us to brag a little bit more in some ways of what we're doing. And so I don't know if we've done that in, in a way historically. Can I respond? It, 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 I'm going to respond from a board yeah. level, okay? Um, opportunities like this come up all the time. I think that the, the, I think the struggle, and I'm not, the reason I'm not using the word problem because we appreciate good partners. Um, but, but it is really hard when people come in to present. It's really hard, uh, when we hear something good, we say, oh, we want that program to stay. But when you think about the hundreds of programs that are in, you can't reasonably expect that everybody's going to stay. And for the board, that is really, in my opinion, not our role to make that decision. It's important to have a process for how we do that, which is the conversation that I think the board needs to have. And so in, in this case, and we weren't going to talk about this, but in this case, I think an appropriate next step would be to have that com for your program to have that direct conversation with administration um, and administration can make recommendations or we can bring it back to the table whatever but i don't think it i think um, uh, and, and i'm speaking from my own experience people know that you're board members so what they do is they come straight to board members and say um, I have this program, I want this program funded, da, 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 da. And what I have done historically is just directed them to the superintendent. So I don't know. So the, and, and all I'm saying about that is that the process isn't clear. I don't think, even though board members provide oversight of the big picture, it is really not our responsibility to designate who gets that funding or not. Because if we did that, I mean, from a budget standpoint, it, it would not be sustainable. So and, it, it, it might be a different conversation for us or something for us to put on the agenda for a full board conversation. And, and I'm willing to do that if that's what the board wants to do. But, you know, again, it is important for us to hear, um, share with our community what programs are out there, help the board become more familiar with what's out there. But then the big question is, what happens next? And, and I guess really more my question, though, is how are we bragging about the successes of the programs that we are dealing with? Because I think one of the things is that things are brought to our attention, that we've got these great successful things that we're doing. And I don't, 
I don't know that we've always done the best job of communicating right. when we have the success yeah. or who are and examples of the successes of the programs. But And I think that's a legitimate concern. And that's one of the things that may be in that uh, the board's proposed activity around board communications and engagement, that that might be a good question for that group or that, that recommendation. It can't be a group, right? <laughs> yeah. That, that came out, you recall, it came out of the board work session today. So that's a good question. Okay, anything else then, board members? Any further comments? Okay, great. All righty, do we have anybody wanting to come on on hearing of the public? Okay, so having no, no further agenda, meeting is adjourned. Have a good weekend. Oh no. So it wasn't a real offer to leave early, right? You I'm said sorry? you could leave. I said you could leave early and then you're ending anyway. <laughs> I said it wasn't a real offer. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you.